Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, anyway, to uh, the, plan the last planning meeting of the year. Um, just before we start, if anybody doesn't want to be filmed, if they could notify the clerk, because the meeting will be live streamed on the council website. So that's uh, be helpful. Um, if we could start the agenda properly. Um, apologies for absence. We received apologies from council at all. Thank you. Um, I've received no items of urgent business. Declarations of interest? No. Public questions? I don't think we have any. None received, Chair. Thank you. If we could approve the minutes of the... Sorry? Um, I have questions. I'm, I'm sorry, there's a process for questions that have to be submitted to the... Yeah, there's a... To ask a question, it has to be submitted in writing, I think, 24, at least 24 hours before the meeting, is that right? Yeah. I didn't put it in writing, I just put it in when I applied. Um, the minutes of the previous meeting that have been circulated. Has anybody got any questions or observations? Not so much the time, it? If not, are we agreed that they're a correct record? Thank you. If we could then move on swiftly to applications, and the first application we have tonight is for 228 Ashton Road West, Failsworth. And this is a change of use from a dwelling house to a house in multi-occupation. And I'll ask Mr Lee to outline the application. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, so as you, you've uh, set out, this relates to um, 228 Ashton Road West in Failsworth. Um, and this is a proposal for a change of use from um, a, a dwelling house to a house in multiple occupation, um, commonly known as a, a HMO, and that would be for um, the provision of eight bedrooms supporting up to uh, 10 people. Um, it does also include external alterations to the property, uh, which includes the removal of an existing conservatory um, and replacement with, a, with an extension, um, and also a rear dormer extension. Um, and it's been referred to committee at the request of Councillor Hindle um, on the basis of uh, the cumulative impact uh, due to the presence of other HMOs in the surrounding area. So looking at the, sorry, bear with me. Yeah, the site here, um, the property is the end terrace unit that you can see edged in, in red on that drawing here. And that's created on the corner plot, which is created by uh, the junction of Ashton uh, Road West and Partington Street, which runs uh, along the side. Uh, the area is a residential area in terms of its overall character, um, but it is in close proximity um, to um, plentiful um, public transport connections, so uh, Metrolink and, and bus routes. Uh, it's also in relatively close proximity to um, a supermarket um, and health centre. So you can see the site here for context. This is an aerial view um, showing the extent of the site. Um, and we've got photographs here that show the current um, configuration of the, the site. So we've got a front elevation um, on the left that's from Ashton Road West uh, and the side elevation here, which um, shows the, the conservatory that would be removed and that's taken from Partington uh, Street itself. In terms of the um, existing configuration again, we've got the existing elevations on screen there that show the, the presence of that conservatory. And we've got the proposed elevations on screen here that show the single story uh, rear extension and also shows the, um, the elevations of the, the dormer um, at roof level. Uh, and here we have the proposed floor plans that set out the, the internal configuration um, of the property. So uh, in terms of the assessment of the application, um, we've got no uh, objections from environmental health. Um, 
who are a key consultee uh, when assessing applications for housing multiple occupation. Um, however, um, as alluded to on the, the late list, uh, we have been uh, made aware uh, post-publication of the agenda um, that environmental health um, are currently in the process of, of, of taking, um, or they've served a notice against the owners of the property in terms of noise complaints about construction um, activity and it's understood there's a current breach of that um, notice. The reason for mentioning that is uh, just to uh, ensure that um, uh, members are aware that that's um, a separate process um, and cannot be afforded um, any significant weight in the, in the determination of the, the planning application. Um, so that's the uh, latest update for, from environmental health. Um, highways have raised no objections uh, to the application and that's largely owing to the uh, highly sustainable location um, of the site in terms of its um, access to, to public transport options. Uh, we have had um, 23 uh, letters of objection to the application and the grounds of those uh, objections are summarized in the report, um, but loosely they do include um, uh, issues challenging the need for this type of accommodation in the area, uh, a fear of crime, uh, absence of car parking provision um, and an increased pressure uh, placed on local health facilities. The, the principle of this form of residential use is, is considered um, to be acceptable, um, especially in this case as a result of its highly sustainable location. Um, and Members um, are, are, will be aware that changes of use to what we call small scale HMOs, which are those supporting up to six people, um, do not usually require planning permission. So that does present um, a, a fallback position, albeit for a, for a smaller um, type of, of HMO. And nevertheless, it does um, offer uh, weight in the decision making process. In terms of looking at uh, residential amenity and the impact, this is actually a two-fold assessment. So we have to consider the impact on existing um, neighbouring residents. And we also have to consider whether the um, type of accommodation being proposed is actually suitable for future occupiers. In terms of the impact on existing um, residents um, and those living near the site, um, we do, of course, have to look at the impact caused by the proposed extension, so that includes the rear extension and, and the dormer. Um, notably, the, the dormer um, could be uh, constructed under the provisions of permitted development, which in essence means that that could be constructed without planning permission, uh, and that has significant weight in, in how we assess it. So essentially that means that we have no reasonable grounds to, um, to challenge its, its appearance but nevertheless, we don't think it has a harmful impact on, on residential amenity. Um, and that also applies to um, uh, the, the single story extension in terms of uh, its relationship with adjoining properties is, is considered to be um, acceptable. We do also have to look at the, the character of the area and whether the proposed use would uh, cause uh, detriment or, or, or demonstrable harm to the existing established character of the area. Um, this is an established residential area and the use that's proposed is a residential use. So therefore we have no grounds to suggest that uh, it would be um, out of character. In terms of assessing the impact on um, sort of the appropriateness of the accommodation for future occupiers, uh, the size of the bedrooms and the size of the communal um, spaces offered within the, the property comply with the council's, in fact they exceed the council's standards uh, for, for HMOs um, and on that basis um, we, we consider that the, the impacts um, are acceptable. Um, there, are, there is provision within the site, uh, plentiful, plentiful provision within the site for storage of, of bins, uh, there is uh, provision for outdoor um, space for day-to-day -day activities like hanging, washing and, and um, and things of that sort um, and in short the application is, is recommended for approval albeit subject to the conditions that are set out in the report. Thank you. Thank you Mr Lee. Um, has any member got any questions of the presentation for clarification? Yes, Councillor Allen. Thank you Chair. Just a, a couple of issues because this 
property is in my ward. Um, he's shown us pictures of the current configuration of the property. Um, and having, having gone past it a couple of times over the last few days, um, it, the, the dorm has already been put up. Um, it seems like this is another one we've come across this, I think, in planning before, where things are getting done and then get brought to planning. Um, and I don't know at what point we're allowing developers to do things and then ask for retrospective permission. I, I don't like that in the first instance. Um, and the impact of the Dharma, um, I think, uh, uh, as, uh, as far as I'm aware, there's none on the row, uh, none of the other houses on the row got a Dharma. And as you come in, as it's on the side of Parting Street, as you're coming up Parting Street, this Dharma that's already been built that they're applying for uh, does stand out quite a bit and it, it does look out of character for the area. So there is a couple of issues there that concern me with the application from the start and I'd just like to get your take on why the dorm has already been built. <laughs> Mr Lee. Yeah, thank you. Um, as I briefly mentioned in the, in the introduction, um, the in, solely in respect of the dormer, this is, the dormer itself, um, so having regard to the existing use of the, house, the property as a, as a dwelling house, um, there are what are called permitted development rights um, nationally that allow uh, alterations and extensions to be, to be made to houses without the need for planning permission. And the, in short, the dormer that is on the drawings here could be erected under the provisions of the uh, permitted development rights system. Um, so. Although I appreciate the dormer forms part of the application and it's correct to assess it, the fact that they've done those building works separately and prematurely, arguably, it does not change the fact that that's been done without planning permission, but it does not need planning permission. Councillor Ireland, down it. It just seems a little as though we're being taken for granted as a committee because it's not the first time this has come up in the planning committee that I've been sat in where things are being done before they come here. And I'm scared of us looking like people that are agreeing to things that are being done. That's, you know, already. Yeah, no, I, I do appreciate the point. And sometimes, you know, when we're bringing applications to committee on a, on a either a fully retrospective or part retrospective basis, there's this, there's, um, you know, where applicants have either made a, a genuine mistake or they've done it knowingly and they've taken a risk and done it, you know, committed an, an offence. Um, in this case, there is, that's not the, the case um, because the, the development that's been carried out, if it's just relating to the dormer, it does not need planning permission. So I, I hope that covers the point. Councillor Allen Downey. Thank you, Chair. Sorry. Um, just with regards to, there was a couple of points in the residents' comments about number of HMOs in the area. And I know certainly on a previous application in Bardsley, what we got in the, in the information was um, uh, information on what the number of HMOs in the surrounding area was, and it, it, it was nowhere near the level which it would become an influence. Is it possible to have that information? And I, I know I'm asking at the time that we're in the meeting. On future applications, if that's being raised, would it be possible for us to have that information so that we can re respond to that point? Um. We can look into it. I think what I would stress is that it, it can be quite difficult to monitor HMOs because, as, as, as Mr Lee was referring to earlier, uh, a HMO of, of up to six uh, people doesn't require planning permission, so we're not notified of it uh, in, in many cases. Um, so to get an accurate picture of, of how many HMOs in the area is, is challenging in the first place. Um, however, we will look into it, uh, as you requested. Um, but in terms of this application and other HMO applications at the moment, uh, it wouldn't necessarily be a consideration that we can take into account anyway, because we do not have a policy that says there can only be so many HMOs in an area. Um, so it, it, it's, um, it, would, it would be very difficult to refuse permission for a HMO on that basis, unless there is evidence of material harm in some way. Thank you, Mr. Richards. Um, Councillor Brownridge. 
Thank you, Chair. Sort of on an associated point, how or do we need to make an assessment of the cumulative impact of HMOs? Because if you're assessing character, then if arguably if you end up with a lot of HMOs in a fairly small area, it is going to potentially have impact on the character of the wider area. So I'm just interested in your views as about it, whether that's something we should or ought to be taken into account and if so, how do we do it? Mr. Regent. Um, I suppose it partly depends on what you mean by character um, in the sense of the built environment aside from things like dormers that might be put in in some cases the physical environment wouldn't change from between a HMO and a house. Um, if you're talking about in terms of impact on amenity rather than character I suppose because of, because of the cumulative impact of, of a number of people living in a number of houses. Um, I say at the moment, because we haven't got a policy on that, I think it would be quite difficult for us to utilise it. But uh, it is something that we're exploring as we prepare the new local plan to see if there, if there is a, a basis and an evidence for including such a policy in a future local plan that could take, take into, into account um, the impact of a cumulative number of HMOs in any given area. Uh, whether it be, say, on a, on a street or on a, uh, a, a, st a part of a street, if it's a long street. Um, but at the moment, I, say, I think it's difficult for us to do that from the point of view of, say, it's questionable whether the character, the physical character, has changed. Um, and obviously in amenity, there's, no, there's little evidence to say that every HMO is going to have that harmful impact on amenity. You might get the occasional one, just like you might get the occasional um, normal house that... Um, has an impact on their neighbours. Um, so I think it's just very difficult to, 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 to use that as a reason for refusal at, at the moment for the, for the council. Councillor Davis. Thanks, Chair. A uh, couple of points on the room sizes. You said about the room sizes meet the standards for HMOs. So it does. Uh, uh, does that mean that you're saying that HMOs have different size standards than other developments? Okay, so the, the council does have um, guidance for um, the room sizes for um, HMOs, and that depends on whether it's um, a for single occupancy or, or a double room. So you'll see from the report that we've itemised the, the size of the bedrooms um, and also made reference to the size of the communal uh, kitchen uh, dining um, area um, and in each case the floor space does exceed uh, albeit marginally but it does exceed the standards that are in the that adopted document um, for clarity that does not include the the en suites the plans show that that does not include the en suites um, so in, in 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 short in answer to your question the um, the size of the accommodation that's been proposed does comply and exceed the council's criteria. So yeah, I I understand that we have the sizes for the HMOs, and you say they, they exceed that size. But the, what I said was, is that, um, are there different sizes for HMOs than they are for non-HMOs? Yeah, the the the, the way. Obviously, that a HMO is used is, albeit it is a type of residential accommodation, it is different to um, a dwelling house occupied as a single household, as a family home, for instance. Um, so there are um, different standards for um, nationally national standards for, um, for example, room sizes and, and total floor space of uh, new residential dwellings. Um, be, there are separate um, local standards at Oldham for um, HMOs. And if I can come back again, I think you, were, you, you spoke about it a little bit, <clears throat> which is what I was going to ask as well, is the, the size of those rooms, the figures that we've got in here that you say meet the standards. Does that include uh, bathrooms and toilets and other facilities that are in that room? Are, they, are the size of those facilities included in that room size? Uh, my, my understanding on that point is so that they don't so they the, they are additional um, so uh, no those uh, facilities are not included within those calculations okay thanks 
Thank you. If there's no further questions, um, we would move on to uh, people that are speaking on this issue. Um, initially, um, we have um, David McManus, who is speaking against the application. Um, Mr McManus, you'll have three minutes. Um, after two and a half minutes, the clerk will give you a warning that you've got half a minute left. Okay, thank you. Um, well, from the 26th of August, um, they came into 2 to 8 before they even had planning permission or anything and started work on it. They were, they've been doing it from eight, uh, 7 o'clock in the morning till 8 o'clock at night, six days a week. Um, they've also done damage to my property. And when I've asked them about it, they've just not bothered. And the, they've, they've made my life absolute hell to the point where I'm actually take, under the doctor and taking medication for it. And nobody at all has done anything about it. I've been in touch with the environmental health. They have been down and recorded it. And they did come again. Uh, and they said there was an enforcement order going in. But I haven't heard anything at all. And I've also been in touch with the... Um, uh, Harry uh, Castro, the um, uh, chief executive, uh, about this more than I don't know how many times. And I've been at this for like five months now. And I've had this for at least five months for six days a week, every day. And I think it's totally, totally out of order. And I think when you're doing planning, you should think about the people next door. It's not just a case of planning, and I don't object to that. But the noise from 7 o'clock in the morning till 8 o'clock at night. I've had neighbours on a Saturday afternoon screaming at them to stop the noise. And no one, and I mean no one, has done anything about it. And the, the people want to move out from around there now. It's getting that bad. It's really, really that bad. They were fighting the builders last Monday outside at half past three. I don't know what they were fighting over. It's just totally, totally out of order. And, and like I said, I live next door to it, and my life has been absolute hell for the last four months. And no one at all has been to see me. No one. That's all I've got to say about it. Oh, uh, he did, did build that. OK. Th uh, thank you very much, Mr McManus. Thank has you. Any, has anybody got any questions of Mr McManus? No. OK, then. Um, if we can move to um, the speaker for the applicant, who's Deborah Day, We've got that in. Um, and the same conditions apply. You have three minutes, and uh, you'll be told yeah. when your time is nearly up. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here this evening to speak on behalf of my client, Mr Blum, of Riverside Solutions, in favour of the proposal for a change of use from a residential Class C3 to an eight-bedroom HMO. In the short time available, I would like to remind the committee of the matters that should properly be at the heart of making a decision today. I trust that you will make your decision favourably and support the planning officer's recommendation for approval. The proposal, as shown in the planning officer's report, is fully compliant with the development plan and has received no objections from any statutory consultee during the determination period. It is therefore hoped that the planning committee put aside the emotional pressure and objection from local residents and consider the hard facts Firstly, I understand that concerns have previously been raised by committee members regarding the impact of the proposed HMO on the local area, given there are already two such uses within close proximity. I would like to make the point that there is no Article 4 direction covering the area, which is an indication that the number of HMOs in Failsworth is not at present considered to be enough to justify an Article 4 direction. As such, my client can still pursue with a HMO for up to six people without planning permission, regardless of the decision today. Therefore, the overall change of use to a HMO should not be a factor in today's decision. Much of the local opposition has been in relation to crime and antisocial behaviour. It is very important that the committee understand that the HMO will be converted to a high specification to attract professional working tenants. All tenants will be vetted and identity checked prior to acceptance and their tenancy agreements will contain clauses to discourage excessive noise and other forms of antisocial behaviour. The challenging targets set by the government in regards to housing gives us reasons to believe that developing properties into HMOs can be considered as an important contribution to satisfy demand whilst maintaining good living standards. 
my client has adhered to local planning policy and has offered a scheme that increases housing supply, optimises housing potential and creates good quality and affordable accommodation. Riverside Solutions is a keen supporter of providing high-end and well-managed HMO accommodation and has devoted the last year's building and managing HMOs in the area. Although there has been some local objection to the proposal, I believe that once the objectors see the high living standards proposed, they will be pleasantly surprised. My final point is in relation to my client appealing the decision seconds. should the committee decide to refuse the application. Given that the application is fully compliant with the development plan and is recommended for approval by the planning officer, my client would be successful at appeal. This has been evident in previous applications for similar schemes within the area. I would urge the committee to consider this and the additional public expense when coming to a decision. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I suppose the, the uh, members will ask questions of you now, if that's all right. And I suppose the first question is, um, could you respond to the um, problems that certainly neighbours and Mr McManus particularly have suffered over recent times? Yeah, but it's the, the noise today I wasn't aware of and it is unacceptable. And I can speak to Mr Blum um, this evening, um, so something is done immediately. Um, I did wonder, is a condition um, proposed to be attached um, whereby Mr Blum would need to adhere to um, building times, um, which could help matters um, if, if he is in breach of the planning condition for um, construction times, um, then that is something that the, the planners will have control of rather than the environmental health. Has anybody, any members got any questions at all? Uh, Councillor Orbin? Excuse me, could I just speak about that? It, like I said... It, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm sorry, unfortunately, we do have, you know, yeah, quite sorry. tight procedures, so... I'm just uh, going to say it's been four months now. Yeah. It's a bit too late to start coming in and talking yeah. about it. I, th I, think, I think what's being said is that um, if this application is approved, do be planning controls as well as environmental controls placed on the working times and how the work progresses. Councillor Holbin. Thank you, Chair. Did I, uh, did I hear you say that there is a, you, you feel that there is a need for HMOs in the area? Um, there, there's a need for additional housing, as always, and as it's the case um, all over. Um, there, it's hard to assess whether HMOs are ever needed. Um, however, all we can say is that to date, because there's no Article 4 direction on the area, um, that's a clear indication that there isn't an oversupply of HMOs. Can I just respond, Chair? You, are, you will have looked then to notice that there is HMOs that have still got empty units while you're planning to build more HMOs? That, that's not something we assessed at the time we put in the application. It's not, um, it's not generally a planning matter to assess whether HMOs are required within an area. Usually the planning matter is in relation to whether um, there is an oversupply. Um, and in this case, the fact that there's no Article, article 4 direction indicates that there isn't an oversupply and it's not considered to be a, a problem um, from the council's perspective. Councillor Serge, uh, Thank you, Chair. Am I okay to direct this question to the resident? Is that okay? Can I ask the question to the resident, yeah? Uh, Mr McManus? No. no. Sorry. Partially we've passed that. Time. All right, okay. That's, that's fine. Particular then. time, yeah. Um, is there any further questions at all? No. Okay. Thanks very much indeed. Could I ask Councillor Hindle to uh, make uh, comments as a ward councillor? Thank you, Chair. I refer this application to the committee as I share the concerns of the residents against the proposal for yet another HMO in our area. Firstly, this will be HMO number four within a very short distance of each other, some within the Failsworth Pole Historical and Conservation Area on others right on the border of the area. These family suitable properties are being snapped up by developers with no connection or feeling for the area, taking away the opportunity for families 
to purchase and continue their use as homes. I understand this developer has purchased a similar property across the road from this one, which he also intends to convert to an HMO. At present, I also understand that two homes already converted to HMOs have empty units, proving the lack of demand for such properties. Myself and fellow councillors have been working hard, bringing our community together, reinforcing neighbourhood bonds. These properties go against that, and I believe will weaken community spirit and cohesion. This area is already struggling with GP availability, and this will surely exacerbate it. There is also the issue of parking. The highways engineers saying HMOs are notable for low car ownership. I, as, I, as I also understand, the developer is promoting this property as high end wanting to attract people like lawyers and doctors, the kind of upwardly mobile people that will own cars for which there is no spaces assigned to these properties. I asked the committee to consider the residents with this application and refused permission. I'm aware that similar properties have been passed by the committee right across the borough against many residents' concerns. This can now be time to work in residents' interest, which is a job of a councillor after all. Furthermore, it would be wise to, for the council to adapt a policy, possibly limiting HMOs in clusters rather than having one family stroke community areas turned into bedsit land. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hindle. Has anybody got any questions of Councillor Hindle? Councillor Sergeant. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Councillor. I just wanted to quickly ask, you mentioned, uh, I think, four HMOs already in Failsworth. Is that correct? Um, yeah. Um, as f yes, there is. There's, there's three, maybe four, yeah. Yeah. And can I just ask you, I mean, I, I'm, I don't know if you know this, but what has been the impact of those HMOs in those communities? Has it been quite detrimental or positive? Can I just get an idea of what it's been like? Thank you. Well, there's, there's no infrastructure built for such properties with, with multiple occupancy increasing. Um, again, the number, of, the number of cars available, uh, GPs, schools, parking. It's just the, the, the whole picture. Um, it's a, it's a small town. It's, it's not built for them. Has anybody else got any questions of Councillor Hindle? This is Gavin to Councillor Hindle. Yes, Councillor. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I'm just making the point that um, Councillor Hindle said there's four HMOs in Failsworth. Uh, I think there's more than four HMOs. I'd say there's a lot more than four HMOs just to uh, make that point so everybody can get the picture. Thanks a lot. Councillor Orbin. Yeah, I think, I, th I think the referral was to four HMOs within spitting distance, if you want to use that term, because um, there, is, there is a lot more HMOs in Fraser, as we know, Peter. Um, but within, within looking distance, I think there's four, maybe five now, uh, within that historical area. Councillor Hussain. Yeah, Chair, very briefly, uh, it's, a, it's more of a question to the planning officer than uh, any of the uh, uh, speakers, objectors, or whatever. Can uh, we just hang on a second then? Has anybody got any particular questions of Councillor Endel before we go into a general discussion and debate about it? Okay. Um, if not, Councillor Hussain. Yeah, just a very simple question, really. Uh, is there a significance, or what relevant is it that uh, the total number of HMOs in the area, will that have an impact on the planning application itself? Um, that goes back to the, the points that were raised previously in terms of there is no policy at the moment that limits the number of HMOs in a given area that, in, in Oldham. So, from that point of view, I... I what I'm, what I'm advising the committee, I think it would be very difficult to defend a reason for refusal that is based upon there being too many HMOs in a particular location. Um, as I've outlined, you know, as we go forward with a new local plan, we will look at if a, such a policy should be introduced in certain areas um, and what the evidence for that is. Um, but at this point in time, that, that policy isn't in place, so it's very difficult to, to, to use it in a decision like this. Have we got any 
more contributions. Councillor Alan Darnie. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I mean, one of the points which refer, it sort of refers back to our last planning meeting, and, and Councillor Bremmeridge made the point in terms of parking. Um, it does seem to be clear from the way that this is being described that going forward, you know, this is being described as a professional, uh, 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 aimed at professionals uh, in terms of who's going to be there, and that existing kind of highways understanding that HMOs are not going to require high levels of parking needs to be challenged. And I know that we can't do that at this point in this decision, but it, you know, the evidence each time is that that needs to be challenged soon and, and needs to be kind of reconsidered. And I don't know how that happens. Um, and then just a point for the uh, quick point for the resident in terms of um, or for residents in terms of, you know, there was mention of the antisocial behaviour, etc. I believe that's a licensing issue. Um, and if there are issues of that kind in the future, that would be something you would take up with the licensing uh, of the property. Uh, but So it's not that we're ignoring it. It's that there is another body there to consider that. And then finally, just the planning officers. Um, I noticed as the offer was made to have a planning condition... Uh, that set times for um, sound disturbance or limiting hours that you went and had a discussion. Uh, is there a, a period that you are recommending for a, cl a clause to be included? Well, while, while they think about that, um, could, I, could I just say that um, we're aware that there's numbers of HMOs that have started coming up for planning permission over the last um, 18 months particularly. And what um, we're very keen on doing is within the discussions about in the new local plan is that we possibly look very closely at HMOs and how they interact and, and where they are. And we want to do that on um, evidence-based uh, material as well. So we're hoping that that will um, take place within the next six months so we um, have an overall view um, on both district and local um, issues to do with HMOs. Um, if we can move on to the timing of work. Yeah, sure. So um, I'll just redirect you back to the the late list, um, which made reference to um, a notice that's been issued from Environmental Health, um, which I, I believe is issued under the provisions of the um, uh, the Environmental Protection Act, if I'm not mistaken, but essentially that's um, been issued on the basis that construct the noise from construction work, which is generated in, in the initial complaint, um, the notice now requires that works only uh, take place between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. Monday to Friday, um, and between 9 a.m. and 1 p.m. on Saturdays only, which would exclude any works, obviously, on Sundays, but also bank and public holidays. Um, so when we're looking at using conditions on or suggesting conditions in this case on planning uh, recommendations that planning permission is granted uh, we do have to give consideration as to whether it's um, the, six, the six key tests essentially but whether they're reasonable to, to add um, there would certainly be an element of duplication if it was added to, to this as well um, that doesn't necessarily mean it can't be um, but I feel it would be probably more appropriately um, dealt with by virtue of the existing notice that's been served under a different regulatory regime, which is the environmental health um, legislation. Um, but potentially, if, if members agreed, it could be added as an additional condition. Thank you. Councillor Glossner. Thank you, Chair. Can I just ask um, how HMOs contribute to the housing targets, please? Well, this is purely and simply from experience. Obviously, um, all large towns, and particularly all of them, has a problem with homelessness um, and, and a problem with single homelessness. And HMOs do um, contribute very significantly to reduce the levels of homelessness and people um, that require accommodation. And obviously, they're, they're usually a very economical type of accommodation for people, particularly on either low pay or benefits, to actually live in. I'm sorry, Chair, that's not what I asked. I asked how HMOs contribute to Oldham's housing target numbers. Thank you. 
But by housing target numbers, I presume you mean the housing requirement in the local plan or in places where everyone is emerging. Um, in essence, where it's a, a, a conversion like this, it, it doesn't because there's already a housing unit there, but it's meeting a particular need of a type of housing, as, as Councillor Dean was referring to just then. Um, that, yeah, that, that'll do for now. It's a more complicated answer I can give behind it, but that is, essentially answers your question, hopefully. Have we got any, any more contributions at all? Councillor Horbin. Yeah, just a couple of things to pick up on what everybody's saying. Um, the need for the type of housing, you've just said, um, and it's already been said that there doesn't appear to be a need for that type of housing, which is evident in the fact that there's HMOs with empty units within the vicinity of this. Uh, and the other issue which Councillor uh, Almadani said was about the parking and where does that fit now in this application the fact that even though councillor dean has said about the kind of people that go in hmos this applicant is going for high end quite possibly with we've all got 10 people we'll look, be looking at 10 cars parked outside if they're the professional people so that's got to be an issue as far as i'm concerned and my other concern is with it being high end at what point if other hmos are empty within the area at which point is the developer or the applicant going to lower his standards and decide he'll put anybody in and not these professionals because he, he's setting a high bar is he going to stay with a empty is an empty place if these professionals don't set the places up do you want to answer that Mr. Sure. Uh, i'll let my colleague come in a moment on the highways matters but um in, in essence um at this point in time need from the point of view of whether we, um, whether we should, ref you know, if you wanted to try and refuse this application, need doesn't come into it because we haven't got a policy that says there should only be a certain amount of HMOs. Um, in terms of the evidence that you're suggesting around, you know, vacant rooms and other HMOs, you know, I think we need to, we need to do a lot more research on that kind of thing to understand if that is truly evidence of there is an oversupply or whether it is simply just part of the churn of a rental market for, for HMO rooms. Um, so I, I, I'd stress that, you know, the need, in a sense, the need at this point in time, in the, under the policies we have, is a little bit of a red herring, if you like, in terms of this, this, this discussion and this application. Um, I'll let you come in on the highways matters, if that's all right. Yeah. Okay, so at the moment there are no national or local parking standards. So if whether this was five semi-detached houses or one detached dwelling, I can't insist on a certain level of parking unless I think that there'd be a problem. In this instance, it's in a highly sustainable location and we're trying to promote green travel, which is one of the reasons why we've put the cycle parking condition on. And we're, we're quite... Um, we don't just let developers just provide a couple of stands in the garden. It's got to be usable by every resident so that they consider them to be secure to try and promote the use of um, cycling. Um, looking at the general area, having said that, that there aren't any parking standards, looking at the general area, there isn't a high demand for parking on street. So even if some of the um, residents did have a car, they could find a safe and legal place to park with no detriment to highway safety. And that's how I've made the assessment in this particular location. Mr. Richards. Yeah. Sorry, I, 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 I realised I didn't answer the, the third part of your question either, which is about the, if you like, the, the front of a better term, the high-end HMO. In essence, it, we, if you grant permission for this HMO tonight, it is granting permission for a HMO. It's not about who occupies it. We have no control over that. Um, and, and, and to get into that kind of discussion is, is a bit misleading almost. It's, it, it, it's the same use class regardless of who occupies it ultimately. Yeah, I, I, I do apologise for that. Apologies, Chair. The, the, the last part of the questions uh, was really towards the, the agent that's representing the developer to see what the opinion was there. Right, uh, 
Um, I think I think we've been past that the, the questions to the uh, speakers. Um, is there any other speakers at all, Councillor Davis? Yeah, thanks, Chair. I think uh, first of all, I'm sorry to hear Mr. McManus's story. It must be it must, it must be terrible not it's being able to sleep. It's absolutely terrible. For four months, it's been hell. Our what I'd like to ask you is, do the you can't speak. Sorry. Um, I'm sorry about that. Um, how, do, how somebody can come here and represent a developer, they must be embarrassed, to be perfectly honest with you. They're here proposing a property, pre squeezing people in like sardines. Ten people here in a terraced house. The sooner we, we, so, the sooner we get the plan up to date and get an Article 4 direction in there, we're just not quite up to date, that's the problem. The sooner we get that in there, the better. Now, I've got a few points here. I'd, I'd like to read a few points what residents have made here, and I agree with them. Overdevelopment of the site will be difficult to reverse, and the area will lose another family home. I think there's two reasons there. I'll read another one. I'll read another one. Parking in the area is at a premium, with many residents being forced to park on Tesco's car park. Now, I think Tesco's car park, I'm sure they have limitations on the time you can park on there. So potentially you can be getting parking tickets. So there's no parking for people. There's too many HMOs in fails, but we've already discussed that. There's far too many. I, I, I wouldn't discuss, I, I, I won't say where they all are because we don't want, you know, because that one and that we're talking about here has been targeted with no HMO painted on the side of it and we don't want anybody you know, attacking any premises like that. We don't want that. But there's too many. Uh, it, it, it's taking away the fabric of the area. It's changing. It's not a university area. It's not a college area. This is a residential area. And, and, and then, of course, I've got another one here. The proposal is not in keeping with the area. Well, it certainly isn't. Absolutely not. And um, personally... I think there's plenty of reasons there to reject this, and I'd recommend anybody when it comes to the vote to not to vote for this, this application. Um, they're all different, and this one has got all, all these issues. And uh, once, it's, uh, once it's accepted, you know, it's got, that, that property's gone forever. So I'd recommend every, anybody re reject this one. Thank you. Is there any further contributions anybody would like to make? Councillor Rickmel. Thank you, Chair, for uh, the opportunity to speak. Um, as like previous HMOs, we know that the local councillors don't want it. We know that the local residents don't want it, but unfortunately, again, in this situation, our hands are tight. There's no real reason, um, tangible reason, that we can use to um, reject this application. Unfortunately, we've got to bite the bullet. So uh, that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Councillor Hussain. Yeah, if I can just come back to uh, Councillor uh, Davis' point. He said once it's gone, it's gone. Uh, can I just ask the planning officer on this? Uh, if there's no need for an HMO, will they need a planning permission to return it back into a normal house? Um, in this situation, in this particular context, I believe they probably would because uh, a larger HMO like this is classed as sui generis in the use class order, and so they would need to have a planning permission to convert back to a, a residential dwelling. In terms of a smaller HMO, up to six, bed six bedrooms, no, they wouldn't. It's permitted development to switch between what we call C3 residential dwelling and a C4 HMO. But, but notwithstanding that, in terms of this particular instance, um, Again, the principle of a residential development, you know, converting the HMO back to a residential dwelling, would be completely acceptable in this kind of a, a, a situation. So, um, subject to the detail, I'd imagine a planning commission would be quite forthcoming on that. Okay. Sure. Can I yeah, just to make the point to councillor was saying there, uh, the point I'm making when this property's gone is, it's a large family home. That are, that are follow. We all get, we as councillors, we all get casework where people want to look, look for big houses, and there's, there's a shortage of large houses. 
when I said it's going to go forever, I mean this large house is going to go forever to a, a family. You know, they, they, there's a requirement for these properties for people to live in. And, and that's what I meant. Okay, I can't see anybody else that wants to contribute. I think that uh, we've, just did, we've had a reasonable discussion on it. I think that, uh, albeit um, there, there are um, some needs about it, I think that we really have to follow planning guidelines. This is um, the function of this committee. So I will actually move the officer's recommendation, which is approval, with, um, an, uh, with possibly a further condition uh, reinforcing the working times um, which was outlined by Mr Lee. So I will formally move that. I don't know whether that will be seconded. All right, Councillor is saying seconded. Okay then. All those in favour of the recommendation of the move. So that's nine votes. Those against? That's three and four against. So the, the application is approved. Thanks very much indeed. If we could move on to the next application now, which is um, Wrigley Ed Failsworth, and this is for a solar farm, an unusual application, but a welcome one, Mr Lee. Okay, thank you, uh, Chair. So, yes, as, again, as outlined, um, this is um, an application at uh, Wrigley Head in, um, in Failsworth, uh, and it's for um, a 0 0.89 uh, megawatt uh, peak um, solar farm, uh, which in, in, in layperson's terms is, uh, amounts to approximately 2,700 um, uh, PV panels. Um, and the associated works and infrastructure um, supporting that. Um, it is referred to committee um, uh, because the, the council is firstly the, the applicant um, and it is a, a major um, planning application. So in terms of the, the location of the site, um, it is on land to the northwest of, of Wrigley Head. Uh, it comprises approximately 1.5 hectares. Um, and it's essentially uh, disused uh, land um, that's located between the Metrolink to the um, south east and the Rochdale Canal to the to the northwest. Um, and the site is unallocated in the proposals map uh, associated with the, the local plan. Um, so I've got so the slides here obviously show the location of this site as, as I've described. Um, I've got the proposed site plan here that shows the, um, the, the individual uh, arrays um, throughout the, the site um, and flanked by the uh, associated um, electrical equipment um, and um, the, the boundary um, fence, for instance. Um, I've got an indicative uh, landscaping plan here, uh, which would be bolstered to minimise the, the visual uh, impact um, that arises from the uh, proposed use. Um, and we've got plans here that show the, um, the, the, the profile and the elevations of the, the equipment and the associated um, development. Um, obviously, with an electrical uh, generating use like this, there'll be need for um, security, uh, which comes from um, CCTV equipment and the, the fencing, um, but also the um, uh, associated infrastructure, um, so uh, the substation, um, for instance. Um, and just for a bit of context, we've got the, the aerial view here that shows the, the extent of the site and its relationship with its um, immediate surroundings. Um, and again, just another perspective there, which is uh, focused more so from the, from the Metrolink um, line. And again, we've got some photographs just giving a bit more context from the, from the surrounding um, site. So in terms of the assessment of the application, um, there are no objections from any uh, statutory uh, or non-statutory consultees, but that is subject to the uh, imposition of conditions that are set out on the, the recommendation. Um, and to the very best of my knowledge, we've not had any third party um, objections received to the proposals, um, either as a result of the publicity that's um, been carried out. Um, the policies in the um, local plan um, 
and obviously the um, more recent uh, guidance contained in the National Planning Policy Framework strongly support renewable energy proposals um, as part of the de delivery of a, of a low carbon agenda and mitigating and uh, adapting to um, the wider issue of, of climate change. Um, and there's no reason in planning terms to suggest the principle of the proposal is unacceptable. Um, nevertheless, we have to obviously give consideration to the impacts and the mitigation um, of those. So the, the, the site is surrounded by uh, development. Um, there is existing uh, tree cover uh, providing some um, screening um, and limiting the, the wider uh, visual impacts. Um, as part of the proposals, in order to mitigate the uh, removal of some trees to accommodate this proposal, um, that would be bolstered with, with new planting, uh, which has associated uh, ecological benefits. Uh, and that includes uh, wildflowers being planted between the individual rows of, of, of panels um, and planting of trees and hedges along the, the boundaries. And that's supported by both uh, the Greater Manchester Ecology Unit, who are more focused on the biodiversity angle on, on that, uh, but was also supported uh, or raised no objections from the council's own um, uh, tree officer. So the, the main impacts on um, the highway um, and uh, amenity uh, would essentially result from, from the construction uh, phase of this development, uh, which is understood to take approximately uh, three months to, to finalise. Um, Importantly, we don't have any, as I said, any objections from, from residents. Uh, we've consulted closely with um, the Metrolink, um, and that was primarily in terms of um, glint and glare, uh, which sometimes arise from, from solar panel installations, because obviously they're, they're orientated to, to, to catch the, the, the sun. Um, and they have not raised, any, well, initially Metrolink raised concerns and, a, and an objection that was later removed um, following amendments that were made to the to the scheme. So in, in short, the, the application is recommended for approval. Um, it is, as I said, uh, subject to all the conditions uh, that are um, listed in the recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Another one that seems to fall in my ward. We're having failed us night tonight. Um, it, and it, it's to do with um, um, representations um, and the, the council officer has said um, there's been no representations from uh, residents, no objections um, but uh, since this meeting was advertised with this on the agenda I've been inundated with residents who have said we have never been consulted on this, we don't know anything about it so I would like to know when the consultation was done because I know I had a, a site visit possibly two years ago um, so if that's the consultation you're talking about, are we not really due another one? Uh, but if we have got so many people that are saying they, they have had no consultation, can it really go further at this point? Don't the residents deserve the chance to have that consultation? Mr Lee? Yes, yeah, so it's my understanding the application has been um, notified in the normal way, which for a major application like this would be... Um, uh, uh, press notice, um, site notice, um, and neighbour notification uh, letters. Um, and it's my understanding those have been um, those have been done. I've got. Uh, I've actually got residents that have said, and they will they will state the case that they they have put representations in. So for the council to say there is none, um, that's that's where it lies with some of the residents now. And, and I must say I've been approached by quite a few. And I know even when I had my site visit over two years ago. I publicised the matter then on my own uh, social media channels, uh, but regardless of that, people are saying they've not had the chance of consultation on it, so I don't know where we stand with that at this moment, really. Mr. Richards. I, I appreciate what, what you're saying, Councillor Hoban. I mean, ultimately, there is a process that we have to follow, and we have followed that process in this instance. Um, obviously, neighbour notification letters don't go out to you know, everyone in a wider area, it is the neighbours directly affected by the proposal. So it may well be that residents who live nearby but not directly next to the site wouldn't have got a letter. Um, and that's that's standard practice in terms of what how we how we can how we notify neighbours. 
I say that, as, as Mr. Lee said, there's been press notices, there's been site notices, um, and unfortunately, you know, if, if residents haven't seen those or haven't taken up the opportunity to, to put rep representations in in the usual way, it is now, you know, what, what Mr. Lee has reported is correct. There have been no objections made through the planning portal uh, on on this application, and that's the, that, 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 you know, that's all we can say at that point in time. But that leaves us. Uh, it leaves me especially in a position now where I'm expected to vote for something when I've got my own constituents saying they haven't had the chance to have their say on something that's going to be on the doorstep because a couple of the residents are the ones that are on Wrigley Head that are right next to the place. So is there, is there no way of deferring the matter for a length of time so that we can see if there's any issues because it's very difficult to put something forward and, and get something approved uh, if we're approving it and we've got this backlash if you want to call it from residents I do I do feel that uh, you know I, I think to some degree we receive um, we receive comments like this on a, a regular basis but basically um, sometimes people do forget you know the, the, this application has probably been in about eight or nine months ago and that's when the, the initial consultation process would have started and certainly it, this one particularly was an high profile one that received a lot of coverage both in local in local press and on social media and um, I, I just um, feel that um, going back to people at this stage it, it, you know would be not particularly helpful but, but what do we say to the people that say that they did put something in and now the council are saying they've had no representations what how do how do we square that Well, Mr. Rich is uh, possibly. I mean, bas basically, there is a system that everything that comes into this building is recorded, both uh, on e on every particular element of uh, contact. You know, it's recorded and recorded within, um, as you've seen from the applications that we have on a very regular basis. As an example, the, the previous application, where all the people was listed, I think 23 households object to the one on, um, that we've just dealt with. Um, so every single one is recorded, even down to, like the last application, the late list, where people can make representations right up to uh, the morning of uh, the planning committee, if necessary, you know, and they would be registered and brought before us. Mr. Richard. Well, if, if I may, just to clarify as well, I mean, you, uh, what you said there has slightly changed. You started out by saying they've not had the opportunity to make comments. Now you're saying they've made comments and not been acknowledged. So I think there's, 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 there's varying. The, the, the people that have come to me, it's varying. Some have, have not had the, they didn't know nothing about it. And there is one or two that have said, we put something in. So how can the council say they've had no representation? Well, as Council Dean says, we have systems in place, and I like to say, no, we have received no objections on through the, the, the either our, um, on email or as we prefer them directly into the into the online system, um, which is the best way to make for people to make representations. So, I think people have been given opportunity, and I think, and as I, as I understand it, we have received no no objections. Um, not sounding the fact that people may have made other comments to you separately. Councillor Alan Downey. So the, just to query with regards to that, if it was discovered after the event that something had gone wrong with the system, what would happen? Um, we would bring the, bring the decision back to committee. Thank you. Um, and then, sorry, the, the question I actually wanted to ask, um, but thank you, Brian, that was very interesting. Um, and notice at the start of the application it refers to uh, grass, uh, grass, geomesh or similar running to the south side of the track. So that's the sort of plastic hexagonal underlay and it's usually intended so that you can kind of semi-grow over it, provides a more natural look. Just from experience from a previous application that I know I came back to when you started, uh, Mr Richards, where it was uh, a truck pave that was proposed um, and it was in the application but it wasn't specified in the 
um, planning permission that was given uh, and the, the surface ended up being tarmacked and the, the reasoning being it wasn't specified in the, in the clauses in the, in the planning permission. Given that I assume that that is there to provide a more natural look uh, and to have those things, would it be possible to add that into, uh, if I get the right place, um, there's the clause five where it refers specifically to the temporary and the permanent access tracks just to actually say it should be those materials. Just confirm my colleagues a moment. Did you refer to a condition then? Yeah, number five. Five. I'm quite happy for it to be a separate one or whatever. It just, you know, that was where the track was meant. Okay. Yeah. So we're we're of the view that condition five, as it stands, covers that in terms of it requires full details of all the things that are listed in the condition. So prior to commencement, we would need to see that those full details and, and discharge this condition and obviously given the understanding we've, we've made the decision on that it includes that material that's what we would expect to see Councillor Aitman Thank you Chair uh, just a quick question do we know how far the nearest property to this, to this development is in the sense that um, if they're a couple of hundred metres away it's not going to make any difference if they're 20 metres away, then obviously, you know, th there might be some issues as regards to the look and feel of it. So I just want to see how far the nearest property is. Thank you. While my colleagues look up to see if there is actual figure uh, in the report, or if you know that a figure off, off the top of my head, what I would say is it's, it's not simply about the distance, obviously. It's about if there is um, barriers in between as well. So having been to the site myself, I mean, on one side, you've got the Metrolink line. So the houses on the other side of the metro line can't even see into this site. On the other side, you've got the canal with quite a bit of plant planting and, and more being added as part of the proposal. So while there are um, properties on that, uh, the other side of the canal, again, there is quite, oh, exist, quite a bit of existing screening that will be added to as part of that. Have we actually got a figure in any chance? Uh, can't locate a figure in the in the report, but I've put on the slide on the screen there that, that shows obviously the context of the site, um, and it does it does show the the, the, the context of the, the nearest properties um, on the other side of the uh, the, the canal there. Um, so it is it is some some distance from you know an, uh, an appropriate distance away from from the site. And for people that don't know the site, the, uh, the railway actually is on quite a high embankment of about 20 foot high. Mm -hmm. So they have no, nobody could actually see this particular development. Councillor Surgeon. Yeah, so just to clarify, uh, those trees uh, along the canal won't be removed. Because I'm just concerned that um, the solar panels potentially reflecting and then affecting the properties. That's just my concern that I have. So if you can just clarify that, please. Thank you. Yes, certainly. I'm just uh, trying to find the uh, the plan that shows the, the indicative landscape. In, um, and will plan. they be facing towards the properties? If you can just clarify that as well. Yeah, so they, they, there will be loss of um, trees and some of the, the, the value of the, the landscaping to facilitate the, the, the development. Um, but we've worked uh, in conjunction with um, Greater Manchester Ecology Unit, our own tree officer, to, to get the best possible scheme that facilitates um, screening as well as providing the security that the site requires um, in, a, in an appropriate setting, setting whilst not um, impeding on the ability of sunlight to, to get to this site for, for obvious uh, reasons. Um, so we've not we've not had any objections from you know any of the consultees as, as I said, uh, which includes the Canal and River Trust, for example, um, and the, so there are uh, conditions that require further information and clarity on exactly uh, what 
uh, landscape and provision would be. So there's some elements that are reserved for future consideration, but the indicative plan you can see on screen there is the, is the proposal as it stands now that we're assessing. And just to add, the orientation, as you asked about the supply question, they're facing south, so in terms of, as you see the straight line, the lines on the plan there, they'll be facing downwards on the plan, if you like. Uh, yeah, kind of towards the Metro Link and, and to the, uh, uh, the vacant land below, to the south. Councillor Norman. Yeah, just a, a couple more, uh, and then I'll leave you in peace, I think. Um, um, the, the noise from the generators or the whatever it is that collects the, the energy, um, have we got details of that and does it fall below uh, the noise pollution kind of thing? And along with that, um, studies into AMFs, have that, has that been done? And can we have some details of that? And then I've got one more. Do you want that now or do you want that after you've answered them too? <laughs> I'll throw them all at you. Right, the only, I, I've just confused because I don't know what I'm agreeing to here because there's that many um, uh, other things. I think there's about 18 or 19 recommendations, isn't there? And it looks like most of them are. They'll have to be done and then it comes back here, if I'm reading it right, or they have to be done and agreed by planning. So are we agreeing like a, a blanket thing and then them bits will come back and forwards or... Should we, should we be waiting for them to be done before we agree it, or is it back to front? I don't know. Okay, I'll, I'll, try, and cover, I'll try and cover all those points. So in terms of the, the first point about um, noise, um, obviously the, the main, aside from the construction phase of the development, when it's operational, um, you're quite right that there is the potential for electric, electronic noise, for want of a better word. Um, that is covered um, in the in the report under the residential amenity section, on which, which uh, extends onto page 19. But essentially, we have um, consulted um, with uh, colleagues in environmental health uh, who have had sight of the, the noise assessment that's been submitted with the application, um, which is I'm just quoting from the report here. Uh, the submitted noise assessment notes that construction would involve low noise and vibration due to a limited requirement for excavation. And in relation to the final operational plant and equipment, um, specifications are, are not available, um, as is typical for this um, for developments of this nature. But potential noise sources would be from the uh, plant, such as inverters and transformers, the associated battery storage plant, um, and the on-site substation. But the noise assessment does advise that operational noise limits would be designed to achieve uh, appropriate operational limits. Uh, consistent with the requirements of the relevant British standard, um, which basically is below um, the ambient background levels. So, environmental health, they are the experts in, in noise, um, and we take their advice, uh, and they've not raised any objection um, to, to what's been submitted. So, hopefully, that covers the, the noise aspect. In terms of the um, conditions and matters that are uh, for one of a, a better word, reserved for future consideration. I mean, with something a major application uh, of, of any scale, um, it's not unusual to have, um, you know, many conditions that deal with the um, the finer details, if you like. Um, so, the conditions that are attached to this recommendation do require a further application to be made to discharge those conditions, um, but they would not be brought back to committee to answer that specific point. And they are delegated decisions. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Hussain. Yeah, I don't intend to prolong the meeting any longer than necessary. Uh, uh, <laughs> just very quickly, for my own information, I mean, I welcome this. I mean, we're going towards greener technology, and this is something that I welcome. Um, just a couple of questions. The actual solar panels, what sort of platform will they be uh, laid on and will they be open for vandalism or will we have parameters around the uh, actual land how is it going to be so in, in terms of the um security provision um there are uh part of the proposals include security fencing um, around the site uh, but there are also proposals to um, have uh, security cameras um, on, on the site um, obviously to, to deter but also prevent any um, uh, criminal activity. 
Um, in terms of the, the, the method of construction, um, they obviously need a solid base to be uh, aligned on um, because they need to be fixed in absolute position to, to, to get the maximum efficiencies out of them. Um, so they would be constructed on a, on a solid base um, and the conditions will certainly pick up the, the method of the construction. Um, but yes, they would be essentially a, a platform, as you can see on the profile um, on the screen, there would be a, a, a foundation that the um, panels and the supporting structure would be affixed to. Can I on there? Uh, not that I think we could include this as a condition, but just so that it's referred to and, and sort of appropriate conversation happens afterwards. In terms of that foundation that's needed, um, obviously, we're endeavouring for this to be an environmental solution. Uh, if it's a concrete base, then we're talking about sunk costs and so on. So just to make sure that those conversations happen with the developer, that that is done with the least amount of sunk carbon cost uh, as it goes forward. OK. Yeah. Thanks very much indeed. Um, can't see anybody else. I will. I will. I will move that we approve, approve this um, application. I second that. And it's seconded. All those in favour? Okay, that's unanimous. We go on to the final application for this evening, which is um, uh, Salmon Fields, which is again another um, enlightened venture. Okay, thank you, uh, Chair. So just again, a, a quick introduction uh, on these proposals. So uh, this is agenda item number eight um, and relates to vacant lands to the north of Salmon Fields uh, in Royton. So the proposal itself uh, is for the um, erection of a, what's called a community diagnostic hub um, and the associated works um, uh, for that. And it's been submitted by the Pennine Acute Hospitals uh, Trust. So the, the site is actually owned by uh, the council um, and it's been brought to committee uh, under the discretion of the, the head of planning um, and that's on the grounds that the uh, proposal um, is intended to form the first phase of a, of a larger development um, on this site. So as you can see from the, the plan, hopefully on the screen, the site shown in red there, um, uh, it's located between Salmon Fields uh, to the south um, and Turf Lane to the north and it is surrounded by existing commercial uh, buildings um, either side of the, the site. Uh, the proposals themselves, um, as you can see on the, on the plan there, albeit indicatively, do include 61 parking spaces that would be provided um, linked to that uh, use. And subject, so just for some more context here, the, the aerial view um, is shown on screen there that shows the, the open area uh, surrounded by um, as I said, Salmon Fields, Turf Lane and the adjacent commercial units. Um, we've got a site plan here that shows the, the configuration of the, the site, including the parking spaces and the modular form of the, uh, the buildings and their uh, layout. We've um, got the more detailed uh, floor plans um, and elevations. Um, and again, for wider context, some scrolls through some photographs here that show the, uh, here the view from Salmon Fields um, and views from within the site. And perhaps, uh, interestingly, uh, an indicative view uh, to show the, uh, how the development is intended to be um, uh, delivered and, and its external appearance. So, um, subject to the imposition of the conditions that are in contained on the recommendation, um, there are no objections from any of the uh, consultees. Um, and again, there's no uh, third party um, objections to this application. Notwithstanding that, um, obviously, we in terms of establishing the, the principle of development, the site does um, form part of the, uh, an allocated business employment area within the uh, local plan. And policy 14 um, is relevant here. Um, and it essentially it directs um, traditional employment generating uses um, to these sites. And I think it's important to highlight the fact that this proposal does not fall within a list, any of those listed um, uses that are contained in the policy. However, um, the policy does make provision for exceptions 
where there are um, community benefits um, that essentially would, would benefit the, the wider community and have some significant um, elements of weight to those benefits. So in that context, the benefits associated with this site um, are the expanded provision of, of medical facilities, um, but it would um, also result in, um, in job opportunities um, on the site. Um, it is also important, again, in the context of the appropriateness of the use, um, this is a proposed facility on a temporary basis uh, for up to five years, and you'll see that the, the conditions in the recommendation um, reflect that. Um, and in short, in pr the principle of the development is acceptable, its, in, its design and its integration with its surroundings is considered to be acceptable, um, and in short, the application, subject to the conditions, um, is recommended for, for approval. Thank you. Thank you. I think, I think that we all, all have to be mindful as well. This is the first phase of um, a, a larger um, diagnostic centre that um, I personally feel, uh, you know, is very significant community uh, use and uh, good. Has anybody got any questions, Councillor Allen? Sorry, I do try and hopefully ask interesting questions, Chair. Um, uh, with regards to the biodiversity loss in this, um, and, I, and I sort of accept the reasoning that's been put forward. Is there any way of establishing, because it's part of a three-phased um, three -phase development, is there any way of establishing a principle that that biodiversity loss is, is recognised and attempted to be compensated for in the further phases of development? Or is that already the case? Yeah, it, it is obviously, as you've pointed out, comprehensively covered in the report. Um, we obviously have to be mindful, um, or we have to consider each application on its own merits, and we've obviously justified in, in, in comprehensively uh, why we've taken the approach we have here. Um, as we move forward and look at um, other applications that may come in, of course, we'll, again, we'll look at those on their own, you know, two feet, um, and take a, a considered view for each application. Um, so, so, in short, there is the opportunity for for the wider context in terms of biodiversity improvements to be considered in the future on the receipt of future applications. But just for clarity, the specific biodiversity loss here would then have gone, and so when the next application comes forward, we'd be looking at the situation as it is when that application comes forward? We would look at it as a whole. Uh, obviously, there will be overlap between the um, site. This is the first phase of a development. Um, so it would be taken into account as a wider site and context, yes. I do, I do feel as well that there's been significant uh, effort put in over previous years because it's one of uh, Alden's major um, redevelopment areas for commercial and uh, industrial development that bio biodiversity was incorporated within the original concept of the scheme as well. So I think that we have to bear that in mind. Is there any um, other contributions anybody would like to make at questions? If not, um, I will move the recommendation. Second, speaker. Also the speaker, who has waited patiently. Um, and uh, sorry, it's Mr. Scorfield. It is. Uh, uh, thank you, Chairman, members of the committee. I'll be very uh, uh, brief. Thank you for considering this application. Uh, my name's Barney Schofield. I'm representing the Northern Care um, Alliance NHS Foundation Trust. Um, so increasing the availability of diagnostic tests delivered in community settings is one of the key central elements of national um, health care policy. And that now reconciles very well with our pre-existing local ambition to make uh, diagnostic tests more accessible to people with shorter waiting times, delivered away from main um, hospital sites and delivering a far more uh, co uh, com convenient um, patient um, experience. And I think it's because of this well-articulated existing local vision that we've secured a place as one of 40 um, first wave front runner community diagnostic centres to be set up across the NHS in England and of those 40 I strongly believe that this centre in Oldham is one of the two or three most ambitious uh, schemes that's of the keenest interest 
to uh, national bodies in how we uh, move, it, uh, move it forward. So the centre will contain a range of advanced uh, diagnostic testing, including uh, MRI scanning, uh, CT scanning, uh, lung uh, 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 testing, uh, ultrasound. It will also contain, for the first time within this part of Greater Manchester, PET CT scanning, which is amongst the most advanced diagnostics that the NHS has to offer, can track the microscopic spread of, um, of cancer, for, uh, for, for, for instance. Now, the combined impact of this means that we will be able to deliver uh, faster access to diagnostic tests, so di uh, diagnose disease more quickly, enable to, enabling it to be treated. And I think in time, the ambition is to diagnose disease at an earlier stage of progression, which therefore greatly improves the survival chances, uh, the life chances of, of patients. We'll target a number of conditions, so uh, cancer, cardiovascular disease, respiratory illnesses, uh, for example. All of those are major issues for the Oldham population and disproportionately affect uh, the most disadvantaged uh, uh, members of the, um, of, the, of the population. So um, thank you uh, very much for your consideration of this um, development. One of the terms and conditions of being a front runner is that we mobilize this development very quickly and therefore planning approval at this stage will allow us to um, get on, commence the works and have the centre um, up and running early in 2022 uh, so that we can start to deliver these really meaningful benefits to the people of Oldham and beyond. Thank you very much indeed. Um, has anybody got any questions? Uh, Miss Scorpion? No? We just pleased to do realise there's going to be improved treatment and, and faster treatment or not. Is it one of uh, the hospitals? <laughs> Could I um, move the recommendation, the officer's recommendation? Is Would that second it? Yeah, second that. Uh, all those in favour? Thank you, that's unanimous. Thank you. And thank you um, for your patience and deliberations and have a Wonderful Christmas and a Happy New Year.